Very good morning to all of you and welcome to the second class of Cole Regis Biographia Literaria. Now, in the first class, we have uh, discussed and we have uh, studied the basic characteristics and the basic tenets of romantic criticism. And today we will start with Coleridge and Coleridge's uh, contribution to the field of romantic criticism and uh, what did Coleridge wanted to deliver to the to, to the to the to the readers actually through his criticism apart from uh, his creative uh, works? Now Samuel Taylor Coleridge, we all know, he's a very famous poet, but apart from his uh, identity as a romantic poet, he was also a very famous uh, critic, romantic critic, but. The problem is most of his works come down to us in fragments or an incomplete or they are incomplete because Coleridge was despite uh, being a genius he was uh, he, he always walked under the sort of inspiration and he always required a sort of mood and that's why we find that whenever there was a lack of inspiration or or he had some certain problems in his mood uh, his, uh, his his writings uh, where they, they, they faced certain problems and that's why only the rhyme of the ancient mariner is the complete work that have come down to us other works are just fragmentary works or incomplete works uh, regarding uh, his uh, cr literary criticism or his, his contribution to the field of english literary criticism we say that uh, we, we, we we can say that only a few scattered works are there all over his prose uh, that, that has come down to us, like the friend, table talks, uh, letters, aids to reflection, confessions of an inquiring spirit, anima poeti, or sibylline leaves. But uh, if we want to categorize uh, the literary works of, uh, the, of, of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, we can divide those uh, works into two parts. One is the, his Biographia Literaria, and the second is lectures on Shakespeare and other poets. Now, we will study Biographia Literaria and some select chapters of Biographia Literaria in this class. But before that, we, we will discuss um, very briefly his works on lectures on Shakespeare and other poets. Now, this was um, a sort of practical criticism that Coleridge did in his lectures on Shakespeare. And his practical criticism may be divided into three groups. One is criticism on Shakespeare and Milton. One is criticism on Shakespeare and Milton. Two is criticism on Wordsworth. And the third one is lecture notes on various poets, mainly of the 17th century. So uh, we can divide the critical works of, of, of Coleridge into, into, into three categories. One is criticism on Shakespeare and Milton. Second is criticism on Wordsworth. And the third is lecture notes etc on on various poets mainly of the 17th century now lectures on shakespeare and other poets these were delivered by Coleridge in intervals between 1808 to 1819 so this was just a collection of Coleridge's lectures that he delivered between 1808 and 1819 but as he did not like the Coleridge was never in favor of of, of yeah, delivering lectures that were very much well organized or they were written in advance. So he did not want, never, he never wanted to, to deliver written lectures. So we find that most of his lectures that come under the under the category of sex, uh, on lectures on Shakespeare, we find that they are they they have digressions, they have repetitions, and they were not published because they were not published within his lifetime. Though we find that there were many parts in those lectures which are published later there they, they have inter interpolations or they have or there are uh, uh, comments and commentaries and and, and additions from uh, from from uh, other people who listen to that lecture other than sex uh, other than Coleridge so this is quite unfortunate for we uh, never get a very complete, uh, never get a complete idea of what was Coleridge's contribution to the field of literary criticism because of this fragmentary nature of his critical works. Now, 
Ulrich's approach to Shakespeare is on the whole impressionistic. Ulrich was very much impressionistic while he was studying or he was perceiving or he was trying to analyze the works of Shakespeare. And according to Coleridge, the greatness of Shakespeare lies not in the details and the richness of his observation. Coleridge believed that the greatness of Shakespeare um, uh, does not lie in the richness or the details of his observation, but in the wide sympathy that enables him to identify himself with the characters at will. So he said that it was not only the objective observation or the richness of details that, that Shakespeare has uh, infused in his works that made him great, but because of his wide sympathy that which, which enables Shakespeare to identify himself with the characters and his own will, that made Shakespeare a great writer. So from here, from this line, we can see that Coleridge out and out wanted to have an impressionistic perception of the works of Shakespeare. Now his lectures on Shakespeare show Coleridge. Now this, this uh, his, his analysis of the works of Shakespeare made him a great important figure in the, in the field of literary criticism. His examination his, his examination of Shakespeare's plays and of poems by other writers gives us something more than an acute logical dissection uh, according to certain predetermined canons. So he never wanted to analyze or interpret the works of Shakespeare through certain predetermined canons, but his observation was out and out an impressionistic observation and which which um, sometimes appears vague or in in uh, they have certain uh, half crystallized reactions but those observations were Coleridge's original observations on Shakespeare every work of art Coleridge sees as an organic developing whole which is subject only to the laws of its own existence. So no predetermined, preconceived law or notion is going to judge or appreciate or uh, assess any particular work of art. Always believe that any particular work of art or for, per se uh, the works of Shakespeare, which he was about to, 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 uh, to analyze or, 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 or study in his, in his lectures, all of these works are complete. They have an organic unity. And we will, in our later classes, deal with, or we will go deep into the very understanding of Coleridge, Coleridge's organic unity. So he believed that all works of art have their own organic unity, and those works are subject to the laws of its own existence. So they have their own laws with which they should be studied. Now, a true romantic Coleridge as a true romantic, Coleridge revolted against, it is very common, and, and this comes up as a corollary to what I said just uh, right now, that, that Coleridge was against the Augustan conception of poetry as an art to instruct at the same time. So Augustan conception of poetry, actually uh, those, those works are of that particular age tended, or they had the tendency to, to, to appreciate or study any particular work of art to certain preconceived, pre-organized laws and concepts. And their basic uh, objective for any work of art was to instruct, to give certain instructions. They were more and more propagandist in their in their in their outlook, but Coolrich evolved against this and 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 this revolt actually sowed the seed, this actually sows the seed for the romantic movement, which gave a new outlook to poetry, which gave a new attitude to literature. And what should be the, the true aim and objective of literature, or the, that change along with redefining and reorienting the very conception of the aim and objective of literature. Okay, so Coleridge revolted against the very Augustan conception of, uh, of poetry as an art to instruct. For him, the aim of poetry was what? The aim of poetry is to provide pleasure and only pleasure 
and only pleasure. There may be, there may be some instruction, but that should be secondary. Pleasure is primary, pleasure is secondary, pleasure is everything. And that pleasure always comes through the medium of beauty. So you can now connect this with what I have said while discussing the basic characteristics of romantic criticism with what Coleridge actually believed that pleasure is the aim of poetry and pleasure comes to the medium of beauty. Now his lectures on Shakespeare and Milton or um, this, this particular category, uh, the, this, are their impressionistic romantic criticism of the highest order and where Coleridge was never judicial nor legalistic rather he gives his own reactions and responses to the works of Shakespeare so Coleridge never cared for what his predecessors who, who tried to or who wanted to analyze or appreciate Shakespeare what they had said what their what, what were their observations on Shakespeare but he solely focused on what he himself is thinking about the about the works of Shakespeare, how he is trying to perceive or how he is trying to enter into the world of Shakespeare, that becomes only and only important for Coleridge when he is criticizing Shakespeare. Now, Coleridge was never judicial, nor legalistic. As I said, Coleridge's works on Shakespeare have never been surpassed. So he he is he he did a path-breaking work in the field of Shakespeare criticism, and that's why Coleridge appears. Apart from his identity as a romantic poet, he appears as a very important Shakespeare critic in the in the field of literary uh, English literary criticism as well as the European literary criticism. Okay. Now, uh, this was the first category of Shakespeare Coleridge's uh, literary criticism. The, se the second part, which we will study in our class, is Biographia Literaria. Now, while lectures on Shakespeare were predominantly devoted to practical criticism, the Biographia Literaria, which was published in 1817, is a work on literary aesthetics or literary theory. So this is not a particular piece of practical criticism. I say Coleridge is not taking up a particular author or a particular writer and criticizing or appreciating or enter into or entering into their world but he is trying to give a general understanding his general understanding of literary aesthetics and literary theory now practical criticism there is Coleridge does analyze particular works now and then but such analysis is meant to illustrate some particular <coughs> critical viewpoints of the poet so in practical criticism we find that in, in, when Coleridge was doing some practical criticism, he was trying to focus on the particular viewpoints of the poet. But biography or literary is more of a general understanding and general analysis of, of, of literary criticism as well as his understanding of literary aesthetics. That's why it is a it is a very important work in the field of literary criticism. But it too suffers from the usual Coleridgean forms. So you will find certain digressions, certain repetitions, and there were lack of organization in his work. And when we will discuss the origin and genesis of of of, of biographical literary, then we will see that how he planned and how he wasted time while realizing the thing, and how he later started writing. What happened? How the second part became uh, bigger than the first one? But what was supposed to be the be the uh, forward or introduction to the book became more uh, bulky than the original work. So all these problems are, these are the cool region problems that we will find. Um, as its name, now regarding the name Biographia Literaria, it's, it, the name signifies it, it pretends to be a record of the poet's literary upbringing, how, how the uh, literary idea and the literary aesthetics of Coleridge grew and how he became a poet, what was his understanding of the, the literary aesthetics and literary theory. That, that, the, the, the title gives the idea that this book is going to deal with this, but there is little consecutive narrative. So it is not, there is nothing biographical in it. As so far as Coleridge's literary understanding and the literary development is concerned, so we will see that there is less narrative in it. There is too much of philosophizing, 
there is too much of philosophizing and too many side issues and digressions. So these are the cool region problems where he was supposed to give a sort of narrative because he said that it is a biography, his literary biography, but we find a little bit little narrative in it. And there are certain philosophizing, deep philosophies in it and uh, repetitions and digressions and all this. So in the first, we will find that there are 16 chapters of philosophizing almost which the letter critics found that they are not uh, irrelevant to what Coleridge has proposed while writing Biographia Literaria. So some irrelevant 16 philosophic philo chapters on, on philosophizing uh, ch um, uh, chapters are there where, where there are only deep philosophies this described or, uh, or, 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 or analyzed or he discusses the poetical. So after philosophizing for the first 16 chapters, he starts discussing the poetical theory of his friend, what's worth not his, but he started criticizing the poetical theory of Wordsworth. And then in the last seven chapters of his book, that becomes only the first 16 chapters, irrelevant philosophy. The second, uh, the second part, we will find uh, he starts discussing, uh, 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 he starts criticizing Wordsworth. And the last seven chapters of the book, he gives a remarkable demonstration of his critical power. And there he discusses the basic things that he proposed while, while, while when he planned writing uh, Biographia Literarium. He analyzes the Wordsworthian theory in a masterly fashion. So his analysis of Wordsworth was wonderful. And that is a very important uh, 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 document in, the, in, in, in English literary criticism. So in a masterly fashion, he analyzed Wordsworth. And there he separated what is good from what is worth, bad in Wordsworth upon the sounder elements based on critical dogma of greater and permanent value. So this is how he analyzed Wordsworth. The last chapters of the book, the last seven chapters, which are the most enduring exposition of romantic theory as it exists in English, place Coleridge is a, in the very first order of English literary critics. So we find while discussing the contribution of Coleridge that there are, despite Coleridge, uh, despite uh, having so many problems of digressions and repetitions and problems of organization, we find that Coleridge was equally expert in practical criticism as well as in dealing with the the literary aesthetics and literary theory. His Biographia Literaria has many, like, like his other critical works, it has also its own Coleridgean faults of repetitions and digressions. But the last seven chapter actually gives a wonderful exposition of what is Coleridge's understanding of romantic criticism. And before that, his analysis of Wordsworth just like his analysis of Shakespeare is also very new and novel. And he very uh, perfectly, like an expert, actually analyzed the uh, poetical theory of Wordsworth, where he uh, separated what is good in Wordsworth and what is bad in Wordsworth. And his understanding, this is in Biographia Literaria and in another category there, but which is on, which is, which are his lectures on Shakespeare, where we find that he made a very, perfect impressionistic romantic criticism of Shakespearean works where he gave more importance on his impressions on, uh, on, the, on the works of Shakespeare. And he believed that Shakespeare was a master in, 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 in the, was the English literary master, not only for his richness and his, det and, and, his uh, and his richness in observation and the details that he has used in, 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 in his observation, but for the wider and uh, wider and, and sympathy that uh, that Shakespeare had for the characters. <coughs> this, this actually Coleridge gave more emphasis than on the richness that he found in, 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 uh, in, in the works of Shakespeare. So Coleridge gave more important, uh, importance on theme rather than on style. And this also we can connect with Coleridge's understanding of the basic aim and objective of poetry, which gives a, gives a basic idea of, of, of romantic movement, that the aim and objective of poetry is pleasure, pleasure and pleasure, which, we, which is uh, uh, delivered to us 
to the medium of <coughs> beauty. Now, uh, before going to the detailed discussion on Coleridge's Biographia Literaria, we need to know how Coleridge planned to, to write a book. Now, Coleridge's letters, which we find, which he has written from uh, time to time, throw valuable lights on the origin and genesis of the Biographia Literaria. Now, from these letters to his friend Humphrey Davy, so he wrote a letter to Humphrey Davy, it appears that around 1800, so that's the thing, he first conceived or he first had the, the, the plan of writing a biography a later he came in the year 1800 and he took 17 years to ultimately to publish that, uh, that book. It was published in 1817. So in, in a letter to Humphrey Devy, we find that Coleridge actually uh, expresses his wish to, 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 to write a life of German poet Lessing. So the first thing that came to his mind is to write a work on, a, on the German poet Lessing and also a treatise on the philosophy of poetry and the title of that book according to Coleridge should be an essay on the elements of poetry. He believed, he, he planned that he, he, will, he will write a, 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 a book on the life of the German poet Lessing and along with that a treatise on the philosophy of poetry entitled an essay on the elements of poetry. Then uh, he had an illness and, it, and, and because of that, that idea was given up. The poet next planned, when what was his next plan after he recovered, planned to write a study of contemporary poetry. He then left that idea, his previous idea, and, and planned to write something on contemporary poetry. It was to be in two volumes. So that um, now his plan is to write something on contemporary poetry and which will have two volumes and the purpose and what will be the purpose of that writing purpose was to examine what was good in each writer so he will judge and um, analyze the works of the contemporary poets and he will find out what is good in them and what were the sources of his poetic pleasure so uh, from the uh, but from the, from the very first objective that Coleridge has mentioned in his second plan, it, it sounds that he is just trying to find out faults and what is good in certain poets. But the second objective is very important. What were the sources of poet sources of pleasure or the poetic pleasure? This is very important. So he wanted to analyze any work of any poetry of, of contemporary time to find out the source of its poetic pleasure. However, this plan too was given up and the treatise was never written. So this plan was also given up. But the intention of writing a treatise on aesthetics still persisted. So he gave up the plan, but he was having uh, in his mind something that ah, I want to write something on. On, on, on the aesthetics, okay. And in 1803, so it, 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 the, the thought first came to his mind in 1800, and now it's 1803, he decided to write the book in an autobiographical form. He, he left the idea of, of dealing with the contemporary poets and their works, and he wanted to uh, discuss the source of poetical pleasure, and he, he wanted to deal with aesthetics in an autobiographical form. So he, he planned to look into himself. He planned to do introspect. But the book was to contain both his metaphysical and literary theory. So he will be dealing with philosophy as well as literaryness. But even of this book, not even a single page was written for full 12 years. So from 1803 it was planned and the next 12 years he did not write anything. So Till 1815, he did not write anything. The project was seriously undertaken only in 1815. So he left, he wasted 12 years thinking and thinking and thinking. And when a publisher friend, J.K. Gutch, advanced him with ample money. So Gutch came and gave him money and said that, <coughs> you have a plan of writing in an autobiographical form, your understanding of aesthetics as well as yeah, your study of the source of sources of poetic pleasure. So this is the money I'm, I'm paying you as a publisher, and you write this book in 1815. That that person did that, hoping to uh, of, of getting his work for publication. Now, now Coleridge became 
serious. And the first part of Biographia Literaria, the, that is the philosophical part. The philosophical part from chapter 1 to chapter 13 was completed in July 1815. So in July 1815, the first 13 chapters were written. It contained his philosophical and metaphysical theories. So this particular part, the chapter 1 to chapter 13, contained his philosophical and metaphysical theories and their impact on his life. Okay, so he started in, in, a, in an autobiographical form. Said, so what are uh, the impacts of his metaphysical and 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 uh, literary uh, philosophical and metaphysical theories on his on his life? Then he began writing the preface to the book. So after writing thirteen chapters, he started writing the preface to the book. The preface grew in his hand and was as soon as the book itself. The preface became as big as the as as those first 13 chapters it now forms the so the preface became the part two of biographical biographia literaria that is from chapter 14 to chapter 22 the part which examines critically wordsworth's theory of poetry so he completed just just think of how ill-organized coleridge's work was i'm not criticizing coleridge but just think of the coleridgean falls while as a critic so the first 13 chapters were dedicated to his philosophical and metaphysical understanding of theory and that he wrote in an autobiographical biographical form. Then he started writing the preface to the book and in this preface, this preface grew as bigger, as bulky as those 13 chapters that he wrote earlier. And in this part, there is nothing autobiographical in it, but his understanding and his criticism of Wordsworthian theory of poetry and the poetic diction and which is of far reaching significance but what he wrote had a great impact and significance as far as literary theory is concerned so he gave a new view a new outlook of understanding what Wordsworth has said or this particular criticism actually laid the basic frameworking for the romantic movement which would have been incomplete when if, if Wordsworth has only written what he along with Coleridge wrote in the preface to the lyrical ballads in 1798 so Coleridge's biographia literaria and the second part the chapters uh, 14 to 22 actually completed the very basics the very basic theoretical frameworking of the romantic movement which actually completed with its criticism of what Wordsworth and Coleridge jointly said in his lyrical ballads in 1798 the link between the two parts that this this link between the first 13 chapters and the second from chap second part from chapter 14 to chapter 22 the link between these two parts actually deal with the his theory of imagination which we will study in this class uh, in, in in our classes the manuscript was just handed over to the publisher and Coleridge first intended to call it autobiographia literaria, but later changed it to biographia literaria because in the second part, uh, there were his criticism on, on, on Wordsworth. When the book was under print, when it went to the place for, public, uh, for printing, a fresh trouble arose. So what were, what were those troubles? The publisher had calculated that the manuscript contained enough matter for two volumes of 300 pages each. So the book will have two volumes and total 600 pages, 300 pages for each volume. Now it was found that there was uh, not enough matter for the second volume. The second volume is bulky, but as far as matter is concerned, the, the content is concerned, it is not enough to make a separate volume. In order to bring the size of the second part to requisite length, much extraneous and irrelevant matter was added to it. So, uh, all which had to add many extraneous, superfluous, or irrelevant things were added. And the book was at, at last published in July 1817 after a delay of nearly two years. So, it was first written, the first part was written in July 1815, and finally it was published in 1817. Now, uh, uh, today we will end the class here and in the next class we will uh, discuss
the formative influences of on 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 Coleridge um, while he was writing Biographia Literaria. Thank you.